So uh, let's go ahead and just jump into things. So today uh, we're gonna start our semester long talk about electricity and magnetism. And so the first thing we're gonna talk about is electric charge. And so the variable that we use for charge is either a little q or a big Q. And so electric charge is just some inherent property of an object. So for example, uh, another example of an inherent property uh, was mass. And so charge is also an inherent property. Now, some things that you may have heard of that have charge are electrons, protons, and unlike mass, where you can only have a positive mass and it's in, it ends up in an attractive force, uh, for electric charge, you can have positive and negative charges. Another interesting thing about charge is that uh, charge is a conserved quantity. And so what that means is that charge can't be created or destroyed but only transferred for example, from one object to another. And so this should remind you of some conserved quantities that were we talked about in the previous semester, like momentum or energy. And whenever you have a something that is conserved, then you have this relationship where Whatever charge you start with initially has to be the same as the charge that you end up with. So this mathematical statement is the same as the statement above in words. So uh, whatever initial charge you start with has to be the same as the charge that you end with. So with charge, we've seen that it has this variable Q. And then the unit for charge is a Coulomb. Named after the person that discovered a law that we'll talk about in a moment. And the 
strange thing about this unit coulomb is that a coulomb is a very large amount of charge. So one coulomb is a huge charge. So for most of the things that we're talking about in this class, we're gonna use uh, units like nano coulomb or micro coulomb. So for example, uh, we talked about electrons and protons. The charge of one electron, which you might see written as Q sub E, is 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19 coulombs. So you would need 10 to the 19 electrons just to have a little more than one Coulomb of charge. And then of course, because electrons are negative, we can put a negative sign in front of this. And then the charge of one proton is the same magnitude as the charge for an electron, but it has a positive sign instead. And so the way to think about, at its most basic level, the way to think about charge is if you add up all of the number of protons and electrons that something has, uh, and then you multiply it by this charge, you can figure out what the total charge of that object is. Now in many things that you encounter in your everyday life, the net charge, so the total or net charge, for many things is zero. So most things are neutrally charged, meaning that they have the same amount of protons and electrons. And what we'll be learning about in this class is when things do have a net charge. So what happens when that number is not zero. Maybe we'll back up for a second and talk about what even are protons and electrons. And so if you've taken chemistry or any kind of science, you've probably seen this before, uh, but just, just to make sure we have all of our bases covered. And we, if we have time later in the semester, we'll talk about atomic physics. And so if you look inside of an atom, which are the basic building blocks of matter, What you'll find are protons, electrons, and neutrons. Neutrons are neutral uh, charge, so we won't talk about them until later in this class. But for the most part, in an atom, you've got your nucleus, which is made up of protons and neutrons. And then outside of the nucleus, you have your electrons that are doing different 
kind of motion that's described by a mixture of quantum mechanics and electrodynamics. And the number of protons in the atom determines what type of element it is. Uh, usually you'll have the same, uh, the number of neutrons is the same as the number of protons. Then the number of electrons will be the same as the number of protons. If the atom is neutral, so the only way to, and if, if this is not true, then what you have is something that is ionized. So if you want to take some element and give it a positive or a negative charge, the only way that you can do that is by adding or removing electrons. If you add or remove a proton, then you no longer have the same element and you're doing like nuclear fusion or fission reactions. And that's a completely different kettle of fish. So in this class, uh, the only way that we are changing the charge of something is by either adding electrons to the object or taking electrons away from the object. And just as an aside, uh, you can get different isotopes. So different isotopes of, a, of an, uh, an element. come from a different number of neutrons. So conceptually, the big takeaway here is that the electrons are what are going to determine whether something is positively or negatively charged. And so the exchange of electrons is what's important for, for this class. So we've talked about charge, protons, and electrons. And we said that charge is an inherent property of an object kind of like mass. And so if we think back to uh, what we learned last semester when we were talking about gravity, we had uh, Newtonian gravity 
that looked like this. Force of gravity equals G, which was a gravitational constant, M1, M2 over R squared. And then I'll talk about this R hat in a little while. This is a unit vector. There was some confusion about unit vectors last semester, so we'll uh, revisit that now or in a moment. Uh, but with gravity, because mass is only positive, gravity is an attractive force. So keep in mind this, um, this formula and this concept. And now the same kind of equation for electric forces. So electric forces and the specific name for this equation is called Coulomb's law. Named after the same person that the unit of charge was named after. And so you see, might see this written as F sub E or F sub C. So either electric or Coulomb. And that will be K Q1 Q2 over R squared R hat. And so it's, a very similar form to the gravitational force. This K is a constant, just like the capital G was a constant. Then you have two charges for two different objects. And then you have the radius between them squared. And the unit vector is R hat, which just tells you that this points in the radial direction. So what is this uh, K constant? Uh, for this class, we'll use uh, these units, 8.99 times 10 to the nine, Newton meter squared over Coulomb squared. This is Newton. And so if you remember from last semester, Newton was the unit for force. M is the unit meter. So that's the unit for distance or length. And then we just learned about this unit, capital C, which is for Coulombs, which is a measurement of the charge of something. And so the something important conceptually to note here is that because charge can be positive or negative, Coulomb force is either attractive or repulsive. So things that have 
charge on them will either attract or repel each other depending on the charge. And we will uh, see an example of that in a second. Okay. And let's see an example of this Coulomb's law. And maybe we'll, we'll do three examples eventually. So first we'll start off with two positive charges. So maybe these are two protons. And let's say they're separated by a distance of two centimeters. So the charge of a proton we saw was 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19 coulombs. And now if we just want the magnitude of this force, so remember if we put a vector into in between an absolute value sign, this means the magnitude. And that means we just want the amount of force, not its direction. And so the only thing that changes is we get rid of our unit vector because the unit vector just tells us what direction it points in. So now if we calculated this, so this was the value of K, our charges are that of a proton. The distance was two centimeters, so point zero two squared. And so the force that one of these protons feels is, if you type this into your calculator, Five point seven five times ten to the minus twenty five newtons. So that is the magnitude of this force. And now, if we want to figure out its direction, uh, there's a couple ways to do it. The easiest way is by uh, remembering uh, one conceptual rule and then figuring it out that way. And then the other way is by just doing it mathematically. So I'll show you both ways, but uh, we'll do the what I think will be the easiest way first. So the rule, maybe I'll put it down here. And you guys might already know this rule that like charges repel and opposite charges attract. So because these 
are both positive charges, they will repel each other. And so the direction of force that this one feels is to the right. And the direction of the force that this one feels is to the left. So how we would do this mathematically, so if we still have the same two charges, they're still separated by the two centimeters. Uh, I'm gonna label this charge one and this one charge two. Now, when I wanna know the force, I'm going to be a little bit more careful and call and pay attention to which particle is acting on uh, the other particle. So let's say I want the force that charge one is exerting on charge two. So in words, this is the force of charge one acting on charge two. So everything that we would plug in would be the same. The 8.99. And then the 1.6 for both of the charges. The distance between them. But now we have to contend with this r hat vector. And so if you draw the vector between charge one and charge two, Maybe I'll do this in a different color. So the vector between charge one and charge two points in a straight line between the two. So this is the vector R. And so the unit vector R points in this direction. And if we're using a normal Cartesian coordinate system, where this is the x direction and that's the y direction, then you could replace this uh, r hat unit vector and let me just uh, write down what this calculation was. And because we R is pointing in the X positive X direction, R hat is a unit vector. So a unit vector has a magnitude of one. So, unit vector has a magnitude of one. And so by multiplying by this unit vector, we're not changing the value of this force. We're just telling you what direction it's pointing in. So uh, because of this picture that we've drawn now, uh, the vector r hat is pointing in the positive x direction. So you can call that positive i hat 
for positive x hat. I'll probably use the i hat more often just because if I start using x's and y's and z's, there might be too many of those running around. Uh, but there's not going to be, there's usually not any lowercase i's, j's, or i's or j's running around. So this might have seemed like a little bit of a trivial example, uh, but when we start doing uh, different signs on our charges, then uh, we'll see how this mathematical way works. Okay. Uh, so let's do the example where we have a positive and a negative charge. Oh, I guess before I move on to that, so if we take this example and replace the two positive charges with two negative charges, uh, this would look exactly the same. Uh, so I'm, I don't think I'm going to do that example. Okay, so now we have, uh, let's do one positive and one negative charge. Okay, so I'll just say that the positive is on the left, the negative is on the right. And maybe we'll keep them the same separation, two centimeters. And we'll use the same charge. So Q1 is proton. Q2 is an electron. And so that means that the magnitude of the charge is the 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19 coulombs. And so if we want to know the magnitude of the force, we would take the absolute value. And so if we do that, you would see that the negative sign that we would need to put on the electron uh, just goes away because of that absolute value. So the magnitude of this force would be the same. Newtons. And then if you wanted to use your rule that like charges attract each other, then you would know that the force that the negative charge feels points to the left, and the force that the positive charge feels points to the right. And like I said, if that's what you want to do on your tests or whatever, that's totally fine. Uh, now, I'll show you uh, mathematically what this would look like. So now mathematically, same picture, same separation, same charges. Same equation, except now we have the R hat that we need to figure out what direction things point. You'll plug in the same numbers. And let's say we wanted to know the force of charge one acting on charge two again. Now the 
r vector between r uh, charge one and charge two is pointing this way, and we'll still use our normal x y coordinate system. So that means our unit vector is pointing in the positive x direction or positive i hat direction. So now we can replace our r hat vector with plus i hat vector. And now the only thing that's going to change here is that now this negative sign, we can pull out and apply that to our unit vector. So everything else that you plug into your calculator would be the same. So you'd still get the same. Oops. Yeah, same force. But now it's pointing in the negative i hat direction or the negative x direction. And that's what we had guessed before was that the force on Q2 is going to point to the left. So just from using your conceptual knowledge, you would be able to figure that out. Uh, but also, if you didn't know any concepts and you only knew the math, that everything would still work out. So if for some reason you forget that concept, you can just follow the math and everything should work out fine. Over here. So if you do Q2 acting on Q1, So everything that you would plug in would be the same. So you'd still get the same magnitude. You would still have that negative sign from charge two, but now the, let's see, maybe I'll call this R1 pointing to two. And so this vector that I drew in red earlier was R1 pointing to R2. So now in black, you would have the vector R2 or the vector charge two pointing to charge one. And so that's pointing to the left. So it's unit vector R2 pointing to R1 would be in the negative X direction or negative i hat direction. And so you would get now a negative i hat. You would have those two negative signs together, which would cancel out and give you a positive. Oh, and the unit on that is Newton's. And so because those two negatives cancel out, you get something that points to the right. And that's the direction that we expected the force to be pointing on charge one. So now the last thing that I wanted to talk about, and we'll start it off with a, a poll of people in the class. Uh, so what, oops. What force is larger? I guess what it, which the magnitude of, of which force is larger? Uh, gravity or electric force or Coulomb force? So for example, it might be uh, is the 
attraction between two electrons bigger or is their repulsion bigger? Okay, so it looks like most people think electric, some people maybe gravity, so let's see. So if we start with, let's say two electrons and they're separated by the same distance R, If we put if we calculated the force of gravity between them, we would do G M1 M2 over R squared. And if we want the Coulomb force, we would do K Q1 Q2 over R squared. So G, maybe I'll do these on opposite sides. So G is 6.67 .6 times 10 to the minus 11. And then the mass of a proton is something very small. or not, not a proton, sorry, an electron. So this is negative charge. Nine point one times 10 to the minus 31st. And then we'll square that because there's two of them. And then it doesn't matter what the distance is. Let's just say it's one meter to make the calculation easier. And then if we do the same thing for Coulomb and we compare those two values, we'll see which one is bigger. So 8.9 times 10 to the nine times 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19 squared. So for gravity, when you plug that into your calculator, you get 5.5 times 10 to the minus 71 Newtons. And then for the Coulomb force, Two point three times ten to the minus twenty eight newtons. So the the takeaway here is that the Coulomb force is much much bigger than the gravitational force. And this is kind of an open question in physics as to why gravity is so much weaker than all of the other fundamental forces that we observe. Uh, but also just going forward in the class to give you a little bit of context for uh, why we want to learn about electricity and magnetism. Uh, not only can we use it for useful things in our everyday lives, but it's a much stronger force than gravity, even though gravity is something that we have a very good experience with because we deal with it every day.